Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to say happy Sabbath, and I'm, it's a blessing to be with you again this first Sabbath of the year. Um, you know, truly what um, Brother Joel was, uh, his devotional message was really uh, something to really meditate on. Um, I want to read a few things real quick before we get into the Sixth Angels movement. This, this is going to be part one, by the way, because this uh, is pretty deep. And there's some symbols and things we're going to look at, but I want to look at those symbols probably next week. If I can continue on this thread for probably a couple more weeks, um, it would be a good thing. But I want to read a few quotations here from Our High Calling. It says, Another year of life is now in the past. A new year is opening before us. These are solemn thoughts, brethren. What will be its record? What will each... In inscribe upon its spotless pages the manner in which we spend each passing day will decide this question this is our high calling uh, chapter 7 paragraph 2 and I'm going to read another one from chapter 8 uh, paragraph 2 it says before you are two ways the broad road of self-indulgence and the narrow path of self-sacrifice into the broad road, you know, a lot of times when we think about the broad road and we even, we have this imagery, I have this uh, screen, screenshot or this, this screensaver that I have on my computer, which shows the people of God going on this narrow road and they're shedding off, you know, luggage, you know, uh, carriages, uh, you know, at the end of the road, the, the, the wall's very narrow, they're on this precipice and they're like, it's just a little ledge. And they're scraping their backs on the wall and there's blood on the wall and they're holding on to this rope which represents Christ. It shows that they're, they're, they're shedding off all this baggage. But that baggage doesn't only represent all of our temporal, you know, uh, let's say our, all the things that we don't need that are physical. But it goes even deeper. Notice what it says here. Into, this, into the broad road, you can take... You can, you can take into the broad road, you can take selfishness, pride, love, love of the world. But those who walk in the narrow way must lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset. So then it has a question. Which road have you chosen? The road which leads to everlasting death or the road which leads to glory and immortality? In other words, the broad road is the road that has enough room for selfishness, pride, and love of the world. But the narrow road, it's very straight and narrow, and there's no room for selfishness, pride, and love of the world in that road. So the question for us today is, well, how are we going to, how, what road are we going to choose in this new year, according to the contemporary calendar in which we live in? That is a solemn thought, and I think that's what uh, really came to my mind again when Brother Joel spoke and we're living in some really solemn times. We're living in some times that uh, we're going to see things that we have never seen before, which we've already seen. We've already seen many things we've never seen before. But like bro Brother Joel said, it's, it, many people have this false uh, hope that things are going to get better. But the Bible prophecies tell us that the final movements will be rapid ones and they will continue to intensify and they will get stronger and stronger and more closer together. So things are not going to necessarily get better in the sense of those things around us, they can be better for us internally, yes, in our mind, in our spiritual walk with Christ, if we choose the straight and narrow road, brethren. Anyway, happy Sabbath again. Um, we're going to get into this sixth angel's movement. Notice I call it a, a movement. Last week it was a message, the, the fifth angel's message we did, because the message was to Jesus Christ, to reap. And, and in a... In a, in, a, in a more, uh, uh, I would say, in, a, in the way that they lived, they were also giving a message to the wicked inhabitants of the world. They were, they were vindicating God's character in their minds. And so that was a type of message that was also given to them in, in a more uh, uh, internal way. They weren't speaking it to, to anybody. Their, the light of Christ shined through the 144,000 and that 
open the mind of the wicked. I'm going to ask you to please put your mics on mute as we go into this study so that there's no distractions because I hear some background noise. And uh, I'm going to invite you also to bow your heads with me and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this beautiful ha uh, Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. You have brought us into this new year which has a clean slate before us. This means, Lord, that we can cooperate with you in keeping that slate clean. We can fight the good fight. We can run the race. We can war in the battle against self. Because, like Brother Joel said previously, the battle is, is for the mind. And so, dear Father, help us to keep our minds with all due diligence. By cooperating with you, by spending time with you, by really putting our, our mind and our effort in... Uh, studying your word and in, in, in really just allowing you to do your work in our hearts. So dear Father, we pray that you will manifest yourself at this time to us. We pray, dear God, that you will speak to us and speak through me. Empty me of anything that would prevent you from using me. And speak to our hearts, Lord. Teach us what these final movements will be and what our part will be to play in these if we are faithful and we are so graciously permitted to be among the 144,000. Because, Lord, you have given us the commission to strive to be among the 144,000. And, Lord, this is the time for the 144,000 to be formed. So, dear Father, help us to really uh, enlist in that uh, special forces unit. For, Lord, we want to honor and glorify your holy name. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I'm hearing some background noise, so I don't know uh, if I have, uh, let me see if I have um, the ability to uh, mute. Okay, yes. All right, so we're going to start off with Revelation 14, verse 17, because this is where, we know Revelation 14, again, as we uh, saw last week, Revelation 14 has seven angels in it. And we know that uh, these angels represent a movement of God's people. The first angel, the second angel's message, the third angel, they're called messages. The fourth angel's message. Uh, uh, you know, these are really movements. So um, we see that there's also messages involved in these movements. Uh, there was also a message in the fifth angel's movement, which was given to Christ. Uh, as he comes out of the temple. And we're going to see what the sixth angel's movement is. This is all relating to God's people. So look at Revelation 14, 17. It says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. So this angel also comes out of the temple. Okay, we, have, we saw the fifth angel also coming out of the temple. Sixth angel coming out of the temple, which is in heaven. And he also having a sharp sickle. So now, this angel has a, a sharp sickle, just like Christ has a sharp sickle. Now, I'm going to be reading a lot from, again, uh, the, the, the uh, seven angels. Uh, and I'm going to start from page 277. And I'm going to be moving onward. So, uh, if you want the transcript later on, it has all the references in it. But I'm going to... Move on, and then whenever I get to a spirit of prophecy quotation or a Bible quotation, I will give you the reference for that. But notice what uh, F.T. Wright says here. He says, Just as certainly as the previous five angels each symbolize a movement of people doing God's will under His protection, blessing, and direction, so does the sixth angel. So just as certainly as the previous five angels each symbolize a movement of people doing God's will under His protection, blessing, and direction, so does the sixth angel. This body of people will do its work when the fifth angel has completed his at the closing up of Jacob's trouble. This is what uh, he says. So we know that the fifth angel's movement begins when there is it's the probation is already closed. So that means this movement here of the sixth angel is also taking place while probation has already closed. All right. Again, remember this angel comes out of the temple. Why? Because God's people are symbolically in the temple. They were in the temple before they came out. Here we see that they've come out. 
But they were in the temple with Christ in the most holy apartment during the fourth angel's movement or message. Here it says they're coming, they came out. Why? Because Christ is also coming out. And Christ, these are those who follow the Lamb of God whithersoever he goeth. This is why they're said to be in the temple when they're in the fourth angel movement. And they come out of the temple during the fifth and sixth movement. Why? Because Christ is also coming out of the temple. So they're moving with Christ. Wherever Christ goes is where they're at. Or wherever the Christ is at, that's where they're at. It goes on to say, The absence of any difficulty in recognizing the people who made up each of the first five movements leads one to conclude that it will not be hard to identify those who will make up the sixth angel's movement. This will be seen to be the case. In other words, there's no, uh, there's no question that the first uh, five angels of Revelation 14 are a movement of God's people. There's no question about that. So that, that tends to lead one to conclude that the sixth angel is also a movement of God's people. That's what he's saying. Goes on, he says, Let us then assemble the available facts about this angel and the movement he represents. In the first case, he is said to come out of the temple which is in heaven. That's in Re We just read that, Revelation 14, 17. This is true of the fifth angel also, and the sense in which God's people, the, he calls them the wise virgins. I would include the wise virgins, right? But we know that there's a third group are those that are in the procession who never fell asleep, which I would say those are the primary group. He calls them the wise virgins, which he can use that also to, to describe them because they're included at this point. The wise virgins are included in this movement, those who have remained faithful through this time and are now among the 144,000. But I would say the primary group would be those who are in the procession, who are with torches blazing hot who actually go and give the loud cry to the ten sleeping virgins and wake them up. That's when the five wise virgins join the procession. So I would say primarily they are those who are with the torches. But anyway, he uses the wise virgins. This is the true, he says, this is true of the fifth angel also and the sense in which God's people, the wise virgins, otherwise known as the 144,000, go into and come out of the most holy place in heaven. This has already been demonstrated. It is in the spiritual and not in the physical sense that this is accomplished for the 144,000 will not make a literal entry into the heavenly temple until after their translation. And that's, you know, that's common sense. It was when in response to the message given at, in the midnight cry that the virgins understood the position and work of Christ in the most holy place in heaven and followed him by faith as he went in before God, even though they were physically still down on earth. That is true. He goes on to say, Since that time, every believer in Jesus, who understands the ministry of Christ in the sanctuary above, and enters into the blessings which that ministry offers, is with his glorious high priest in the temple of God in heaven. While Christ remains there, so by faith will they. But when he leaves, they will come out with him. For the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Thus, when the ministry in the Most Holy is finished, and Christ lays off his priestly attire in exchange for his kingly robe and crown, and then leaves the temple to journey to this earth, the believers in Jesus will come out with their spotless high priests and they continue to follow him in their spiritual walk of faith. It is for this reason that both the fifth and the sixth angels are said to come out of the temple which is in heaven. Amen. Again, I'm going to ask uh, for those of you who uh, don't have your mics on mute. You can put them on mute. All right. I'm going to do something here so I can try to do this quickly. All right. So we want to keep all the distractions away as we continue on. 
So this would indicate that the members of the fifth and the sixth angels movement are the same, brethren. This is to be expected and it is in fact the case. God planned that it should be thus with all the previous movements. It was not His will that a large proportion of the people who came out, out to, to form the first angels movement should have failed to follow on with the second angel as His work began and developed. In other words, those who remain faithful and still remain alive will continue to go forward in the movement that God uh, institutes. All right. So he goes on to say, If God could have achieved it, every person who had responded to the message and ministry of the first angel would likewise have proclaimed the truths of the second, third, and fourth and would have gone on to participate in the final witness given by the fifth, sixth, and seventh. If this had been achieved, brethren, there would have been no need for the fourth. In other words, it could have all been wrapped up during the third angel's movement and message. So, it, But it wasn't achieved. But if it could have been achieved, there would have been no need for the fourth, which had to be sent because the Advent people had lost the truths of the first three angels. Now, he goes on to say that the work of God through his angelic messengers was delayed again and again because of human imperfection and failure. But once probation has closed, there will be no delay, no more delay. And not one person will fall away into apostasy. Praise the Lord. Why? Because everyone is sealed at that time. Once probation closed, you have the sheep and the goats and they're fixed. There's no sheep that will become goats and there's no goats that will become sheep at that time. Neither will any be called upon to lay down his life anymore once the final seal has been affixed. Why? Because there's no need for... You see, the blood of the martyr is seed, but there won't be need for any seed because there won't be any more, uh, any more fruit growing after that. There won't, no, nobody else will be converted after everyone is sealed. Therefore, every person who is a member of the fifth angel's movement will go on to be a part of the sixth as well. And I pray that each one of us here really have a desire to be among the 144,000. Because that's my desire. And, and I think that's God's desire. God's desire is for each and every one of us to be His special forces, His elite. He says, the fifth angel does not finalize the, the Lord's work. Notice here, this is important to understand. You see, we have to understand that after the fourth angel's movement, which is going on right now, we're living in the time of the fourth angel's movement right now. That movement will not finalize the Lord's work. In a certain sense, it will. One part of the work, but not the full scope of the work. Likewise, the fifth angel's movement does not finalize the Lord's work. There's still a yet another. And we need to understand what these are. And it's very grievous when we get to understand the sixth angel's movement. In a sense, it's sweet and sour, in a sense. Notice here, his mission, as has already been seen, is to be the shining... We're talking about the fifth angel now. This was the fifth angel's movement, which we looked at last week. His mission, the fifth angel's movement, as has already been seen last week, we saw it, is to be the shining instrument through whom the Lord will reveal the light of His character in such clarity and brilliance that even the most wicked person on the earth will be led to see and to acknowledge the beauty, justice, and righteousness of God's immaculate spirit and life. Last week we saw that the fifth angel even though it doesn't give any special message verbally to the, the, the inhabitants of the earth at that time, because everyone is sealed, the message that they give is primarily to Christ to come in and reap. They are giving a message in example, in life, to the wicked. It opens their eyes to recognize that it is, that God was always right, that God is was the, the righteous one, that they are the unrighteous. It, 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 
it, it sparks an awakening in their minds. And they get to see that God, God's character was always immaculate and beautiful. And we're going to see what happens during the Six Angels movement, which we'll see happens right after that. Now, when this work shall have been completed, talking about the fifth angel, there will yet remain some unfinished business arising as the natural development of the fifth angel's work. This must be completed before the way is fully prepared for the second coming of Christ. And it is the, it is the work of the seventh angel to urge the sixth to complete this mission. So the seventh angel is the one that urges the sixth to complete this mission. Mission. And how do we know that this is true? Well, the Bible says it. The Bible gives us this exact description. Notice Revelation 14 verse 18, describing the seventh angel and how it speaks to the sixth. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, as there are now we saw this before. We saw that Christ comes out of the temple, but he has a sharp sickle. And so do God's people, the sixth angel's movement. This angel also has a sharp sickle. So who is this angel? seventh angel talking to is this seventh angel talking to Christ or is this seventh angel talking to the sixth angel which is a representation of God's people well in the seven angels page 279 paragraph 5 it says as there are two beings in this chapter who are carrying sickles Care must be taken to rightly determine who is being addressed by the seventh angel. The only two possibilities are he who sits on the great white cloud with the sharp sickle in his hand or the sixth angel. Whichever one of these two responds to the appeal of the seventh angel to thrust in his sharp sickle and reap must be the one addressed. This proves to be the sixth angel. So that's interesting. The seventh angel has a message to someone with a sharp sickle. He doesn't really tell us which, if it's Christ who sits on the great white cloud with his sharp sickle in his hand. Or the sixth angel which also has a sharp sickle in his hand. So what, the, what we're told here in this quotation is that the way to know who is the one being addressed is by seeing who responds to that call. And so we, we find the answer to that question, who responds to that call of the seventh angel, in Revelation 14, verses 19 to 20. Notice what it says in Revelation 14, 19 and 20. And the angel, notice who, who's the one that thrust in the sickle? Is it Christ who sits on the cloud? No, it's the angel. Notice, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, the reason why we need two parts to this study is because next week, I'm hoping, if I have an opportunity to do Sabbath school again, I want to go into what is this wine press? What is the horse? Who, who, what are these horses? And the horse's bridle. You know, uh, because it says the blood, it says, and, and what does it mean to be trodden without the city? Because it says the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth. He gathered the vine of the earth. So there's a vine that's going to be gathered. We, we need to know what that vine is of the earth. That term, of the earth, vine of the earth. We want to know what that means. And casting it into the great wine press. What is the wine press? What is that? And, and, and it says, the wine press was trodden without the city. What, what, what does that mean, without the city? 
And it says the blood came out of the wine press even onto the horse bridles. That means this blood came very high on the level of the earth, even up to the horse's bridle. That, I mean, what does that mean? You know? And it says, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Well, what does that mean? These are all symbols in this prophecy that we're going to break down uh, if I have an opportunity next week. That's why this is going to be a part one and part two. But... This harvest, okay, that this angel, this angel is going to thrust in his sickle into the earth and gather the vine of the earth. In other words, there's going to be a harvesting, right? And this, according to the, uh, TSA, uh, the, the seven angels, 279 paragraph 8, it says, This harvest is an ingathering, not of souls to eternal life as reaped by the conquering king, but a harvest of death in which millions perish. This is very grievous, brethren. In fact, the slaughter will be so terrible and extensive that only the 144,000 will survive it. It will be achieved by a combination of two things. The unrestrained fury of the wicked which leads them to attack one another with unbridled ferocity and the awful outpouring of the seventh plague, which we know again is is nature being permitted to go into chaos. So what are we seeing here? You know, we're seeing that it's not God's people that bring any destruction upon anyone. They're not doing any destructive things. Neither is God. But we're going to break that down a little bit as we go on, right? Now, in the mad strife of their own fierce passions, and by the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath, Fall the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers, and people, rich and poor, high and low. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. And we find that quotation in Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 33. And also I just quoted from the Great Controversy, page 657. Inspiration calls it, a, a, a uh, awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath. And we know what that means, brethren. We know these are idioms. We, not, you know, these are figures of speech, uh, so, to, so, so to speak. We know what the wrath of God is. It's really when God is pushed away. And we'll see that as we continue. But it means that God, there's been a separation. And we find that principle again in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Deuteronomy 31, 17. There's a separation that causes... Uh, you know, destruction to come upon people. It's because they're no longer under God's protection. He's the shield which has been rejected. Now, going back to TSA, when I say TSA, I'm talking about the seven angels. Uh, page 280, paragraph 1. It is when the work of the fifth angel has brought the guilty inhabitants of the earth to a true realization of God's character and of their own rejection of divine light and truth, that this awesome destruction of human life will really, will really get underway. So great, widespread, ferocious, and climactic will this annihilation of humanity be that there is danger of overlooking the fact that it will be but the culmination of the increasing work of death and destruction which has been going forward under the first four plagues, each of which will be so terrible that if it were universal in extent, humanity would be wiped out before the fifth angel would be able to accomplish his work. And we know that these plagues are going to begin as soon as the Sunday law is implemented. Plagues are happening now, but the Bible describes the seven last plagues. Seven last plagues. Now, in referring to the first plague, the Great Controversy, page 628, paragraph 2, says the following. These plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the earth would be wholly cut off. Yet they will be the most awful scourges that have ever been known to mortals. All of the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. 
But in the final judgment, wrath is poured out unmixed with mercy. TSA, page 280, paragraph 3, also quoting from the Great Controversy, says that during this, the period of these first four plagues, the songs of the temple shall be howling in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. The wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence. But you know what the good news is, brethren? During this whole time, God's people are protected. Not saying God's people are not going to suffer, you know, they're going to also be going through a lot of anguish. They might even endure hunger and delay. But they will be protected. They will be protected from these plagues that are falling upon humanity all around. That's good news if we're faithful. This is why compromise is not an option. It's not. Compromise is not an option. We have now moved into a new year with a clean slate. The page is clean, brethren. The record is now being recorded. New, a fresh new record for each and every one of us. What are we going to do with this year? Are we going to cooperate with God to keep that slate clean from any defilement? Or will we, will we be carrying out our business as usual? These are some solemn messages that God is giving to us. Because we're living in some solemn times. And we've been giving some solemn messages for a long time. But now we can see things are starting to come to fruition. What are we going to do in 2021? Do we really think things are going to get better? Deep down inside, do we think that? Or do we really believe the Word of God, which tells us things are going to increase in intensity and, 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 and uh, in frequency? Notice here, quoting from the Great Controversy, page 629, TSA 280, paragraph 4, says, The scourge shall also encompass the animal kingdom. Wow, what is this telling us? The scourge shall also encompass the animal kingdom with fearful loss of life among domestic farm animals. When the dreadfully intensified heat of the sun during the fourth plague withers the grass, the animals will die by the millions. Although the fig tree, now quoting from uh, uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Great Controversy 629 says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. That's also probably, I believe that's quoting from the Bible as well. You know, we hear coming down the pike of food shortages. And a lot of things that you know, we're hearing. Well, you know what? Eventually that will be a reality. Eventually there will be food shortages. Eventually there won't be the heat of, the four, uh, of this fourth plague will be so intense that it's going to burn up all the crops. This is why we need the umbrella of God's protection over us. And over, we're going to see that God not only protects us, but He also protects our habitational places. We're going to see that. It's amazing, brethren. The safest and most beautiful place to be is under the shadow of the Almighty. I tell you. We're going to see that as we continue. So there's good news. Those who survive these devastations are the ones who will be involved in the even greater universal slaughter that will encompass the world after the fifth angel, the 144,000, has done his work. Under his ministry, as we have already seen, the wicked will experience a terrible awakening in which they will see for themselves the true character of God's holy and righteous laws or principles, which we know are his principles of agape love, and of the sovereign of the universe who made them. But they're embodied in what? In the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are principles of agape love, which are called the law of God. They're called the law. So the righteous will see the true character of his law and of God. Their first reaction will be to fall at the saints' feet in hearty acknowledgement of the correctness of the position maintained by them while confessing in heartbroken, soul-destroying anguish the evil of their own ways. It will be a terrible moment of truth 
which will be horrible to look upon and even worse to experience. I'm going to say that again. It will be a terrible moment of truth which will be horrible to look upon but even worse to experience. We don't want to be among the goats at that time. We want to be God's sheep. The sheep hear His voice and they follow Him. TSA 281 paragraph 1 says, This will also bring to the lost an indescribably devastating soul-torturing sense of what they have forfeited by choosing the easy popular side in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. They will be beside themselves with unrestrainable and uncontrollable hatred and the desire to revenge themselves on those who have influenced them to make the wrong decisions. You know, there's many that Satan is using today to bring a wrong influence upon the masses. There are uh, false shepherds all over the world. There are friends uh, that are really foes in, dis in disguise. Uh, they might not even look at themselves as foes because, you know, they're deceived. Many people are deceived in this world. And they think they're doing the right thing. But in reality, they don't realize that they are actually foes. And they're actually bringing uh, people to destruction. But at that time, we're told in TSA 281 paragraph 2, everyone will see everyone else as the cause of his loss. Think about that. Everyone will see everyone else as the cause of his loss. But all will unite in leveling at the apostate ministry the major burden of responsibility for their in incre incredibly dis desperate situation. So in other words, what this is saying is that when the wicked are awakened, they're going to start turning on each other. They're going to see that people have led them, they have allowed themselves to be led by individuals into their condition. And, but all will start to point towards the religious leaders because they, they, this is a religious situation, right? God has now revealed through the 144,000 that his law or his principles were righteous and all these ministers who were saying no that's wrong that's wrong that is not true the law was done away with it was nailed to the cross you can be saved by faith alone without any corresponding works in other words your life doesn't have to change all you have to do is profess that you believe in God and you're going to be saved all these uh, teachings you know they're going to start remembering where they got these teachings from. The people see, this is great controversy, page 655, 656. It says the people see, so they have been awakened, that they have been deluded. Uh, I see some, there's a, there's somebody, I think there's a, some noise, background noise, if anybody is on, can uh, mute your mics. Okay, thank you. Quoting again, Great Controversy 655, 656, it says, The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. And why is it so, they talk you know, so much about the law of God? Because at the end, it's going to be uh, the Sabbath Sunday issue. You know, Sabbath, even though it's not really a Sabbath Sunday issue per se, the, the, the issue of, you know, whether we worship God or worship man will be uh, brought to the forefront in the Sabbath Sunday issue uh, when the, this country enforces a Sunday law. So they have been led to think that that was all foolishness and they, they received the mark of the beast because they listened to their ministers who said that the law was nailed to the cross because every person believes that the law is really good, right? What is the law? Worship God with all of your heart, right? Worship Him, uh, you know, 
you know, uh, don't don't worship any idols. You know, uh, don't use the Lord's name in vain. You know, don't kill, steal, commit adultery, covet. You know, all these things are good, except they have an issue with the Sunday and Sabbath issue. They they have a problem. They they in other words, nobody has a problem with keeping nine of the ten commandments, but when it comes to the Sabbath, that's when it becomes an issue, and it will rise and rise and rise to the point where the Christian community in this country will push the legislators to enforce the religious dogma of Sunday sacredness as opposed to the Bible Sabbath. And that's when there's a, there's a, uh, a, a I wouldn't say a competition, but that's when there's a battle between man's uh, own perversion of God's ways or God's ways. In other words, God's law or man's law. That's when it, it, there's a battle between the two. And those who worship God are going to follow God. And they're going to say, no, we choose God's ways because God's ways are perfect. And the rest are going to say, no, that's all foolishness because our pastors said that all of that's been done away with. And, and we should follow what the majority are doing because it's a good thing. And it's going to sound like a good thing, but it tends to destruction. All right, so let's continue. That's why it's important for us to understand what the law is. Is it really a set of rules or is it just principles of agape love? And when we understand this, we will understand that God has given us principles of agape love, not rules to follow because none of us can follow rules uh, without um, uh, having... Well, we can follow rules, of course. You can follow a rule. But the point is that these spiritual uh, rules, like the, the commandments, are principles. They're not rules. And these principles are divine. You can't love your enemies, for, for instance, right? Agape love is when you can love your enemy. Well, how can you love an enemy with a carnal nature? We can't. It's impossible. So it's impossible for humanity to be able to uh, incorporate these divine principles in our lifestyles without inviting the Holy Spirit to abide inside of us and to change our hearts. So... And because so many people have trouble with these things, they just say, well, it's just done away with. We don't have to worry about these things. Well, in reality, what we're saying is we, we want to abolish God's love. And God's love cannot be abolished, brethren. The, the principles of God's love can never be abolished. God, or else God could be abolished himself. So notice here, TSA 281 paragraph 4. Once this state of things has been reached, the stage is set for the next act in the drama the unleashing of that unrestrainable human passion and fury by which the wicked will destroy each other. Now, the multitudes are filled with fury. And you know what they say? We are lost, they cry. And you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords, which we know will be probably AK-47s at that time or whatever, because not too many people are using swords in, in 2020 or 21. Uh, they're using guns, right? But this, this use, they, we use the word sword. The Bible uses the word sword. It just means weapons, right? The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies, which are who? The pastors. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. These are the enemies. The wicked are the enemies of God's people. They're destroying each other. Brethren, I want you to understand, this is prophecy. This is not something made up. This is in the Bible. It's very clear. During the river Euphrates, the drying up of the river Euphrates, the sixth uh, plague, it's in the Bible, Revelation chapter 16. This is all biblical. It's prophetic. This is not somebody's idea or theory or philosophy. This is God showing us behind the scenes. We're looking at a backstage view of what is going to take place in the near future. We have a part to play. We can be in the sixth angel's movement. We can be the sixth angel of Revelation 14. We can be the fifth angel. We can, we're right now we can be the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Or... We can be on the other side because we want to choose our own way. But at that time, if we choose that, we will be awakened at that time. But at that time, it will be too late. 
and there will be a great slaughter among us. Now notice here, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. This is quoting Jeremiah 25, 31. So this is all from the scriptures. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Notice that it says he will give. Doesn't mean he's bringing the sword upon the wicked. He will allow. Give is another word of letting go. When you give something to somebody, you're not throwing something at somebody. You're letting go of something into somebody else's hands. You're giving up. You're giving it over. Notice Jeremiah 25, 31 uses that same language. Say that God is not the one bringing this, this destruction upon the wicked. We, we read that they will actually destroy one another. Just like we saw in biblical times, and many times uh, we saw the enemies of God's people doing the very same thing. Well, that history will be repeated during the sixth plague and during the sixth angels movement. For 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have, been, all have made their decisions. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of His down, downtrodden law. Again, here we go with this... this downtrodden law I mean when people hear that word law they get anxious you know they get antsy because they, they think well how we can't keep that law and it's true we cannot keep God's Ten Commandment law in our carnal nature using our own human effort but if when we understand that they're not they're not really laws but principles but Jesus Christ said it himself Jesus Christ said the Ten Commandments can be summed up in these two. Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's exactly what the Ten Commandments teach. The first four commandments teach us how to love God with all of our heart. The remaining six commandments teach us how to love man. It's all the law of love. They're just principles of agape love. So when we understand that, we will understand what all of these quotations are really saying. It says, again, I'm TSA 281, paragraph 6. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of His downtrodden law. Now the controversy is not alone with Satan, but with men. The Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. So again, what are we seeing? God is uh, he's giving them over. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. He will not tell... You know, there's a lot of people that believe that uh, God's people, the 144,000, are going to pick up swords to, to annihilate people. You know, these that's called shepherd rodism, right? They teach that, uh, that uh, God's people are the ones that are going to pick up the swords and, and start killing and slaying. You know, well, that goes totally contrary to the understanding of God's character. Because here we see that even as Jeremiah 25, 31 says, God says, no, I'm going to give them that are wicked to the sword. I'm going to give them over to the, what they have chosen. I'm not going to bring the sword upon them. I'm going to give them over to the sword. Okay? Now, notice here in TSA 281, paragraph 7. It says, The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done. The, what is the mark of deliverance, brethren? The mark of deliverance, we know it to be the seal of the living God. That is what the mark of deliverance is. Um, we're going to ask you to put your mics on mute, please. Uh, I think that's somebody coming in now. I apologize for the background noise. I'm trying to see if I can mute them, but I guess until they come in, you can't really mute them. But anyway... So those who have the seal of God, brethren, which we are called to receive, are going to be those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves, do we feel anything in our hearts when we see the condition of the world? 
Because that could be an indicator to us that we need more of the Spirit of God. If we don't, if we don't feel, if we don't feel that sighing and crying. In other words, if we don't, if our heart is not breaking inside because of what is going on around us, even within our family members and even in our church family, or whatever the case may be, if we're not sighing, crying, if we don't feel that that sympathy and that deep heart wrenching, then we need to really, really analyze our condition and ask God to give us more of His Spirit. Because the mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done. Now, the angel that, of death, now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maid and little children. And this is quoting from Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 to 6, which the shepherd Raj teach is God's people. But we're going to see what they really are in this study, because they're not God's people, in, in the real literal sense of the word. But notice here, now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. The mark of what? The seal of God. And begin at my sanctuary. Says the prophet, they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Here it's called the mark, uh, the seal of God, a mark as well. So remember that a mark is the same as a seal, a sign, whatever. It's all the same thing. Right? So you have a mark of God and you have a mark of the beast. Or you have a seal of God or the seal of the beast. They could be inter interchangeable. And in Ezekiel 9 we see that, that it's interchangeable. The seal of God is called the mark in, in Ezekiel. The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. This is a, a serious, serious time. And the, the people of God, the sixth angel movement, this is going to be a horrible ordeal for them. But who is this, you know, who, who is this uh, angel with the slaughtering weapons? What, what is this, really? Right? Now, quoting from Isaiah 26, 21, Zechariah 14, 12, verse, thir and thir verse 13, the Bible says, The Lord cometh out of His place. And it uses this figure of speech to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This is speaking about that time during the sixth angel's movement. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor. And his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. This is again describing the sixth plague, the uh, drying up of the river Euphrates, which represents people, multitudes, nations, and tongues, all coming against each other. Every hand rising against the hand of his neighbor, according to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12 and 13. This is prophecy, brethren. This is not some fairy tale. This is real uh, future uh, uh, events that are going to take place. Pretty soon, mind you. Pretty soon. And if we're faithful, we will be among this sixth angel's movement. And it will be a horrible ordeal to witness what is going to take place during this sixth movement. Again, quoting from Isaiah 24, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. The Bible says, and also quoting from TSA 282, paragraph 2. At the coming of Christ, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. Now what does that really mean? Notice that the bright 
during the fifth angel's movement, just, just something that came to my mind just now. Think about this for a minute. When do they receive the brightness of His glory? In reality, it's during the fifth angel's movement. Think about that for a minute. When do they receive an awakening of the righteousness of God and His, and His principles? During the fifth angel's movement. So when the Bible is talking about that they're consumed with the spirit of His mouth and destroyed by the brightness of His glory, what does that... Re you see, brethren, God is bringing us... He's, you know what He's doing? He's, he's, he's reining us in and bringing us tighter and tighter into understanding truth and, and getting more and more details. Notice this. Christ takes His people to the city of God and the earth is emptied of its inhabitants. When He comes, that's what He does, right? Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord has spoken this word, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Now we saw here during, what we're seeing is that they're not at this time literally burned, right? So what does that mean? The glory of God is described as a fire which burns. Right? But it's, it's a metaphor for the revelation of God's love. What does the fifth angel's movement do? Reveal the love of God to such a degree that it brings conviction to the wicked. They realize that they're on the wrong side. They realize that God was true and righteous. And they realize that the, they have been duped. And they turn on each other. And the river of Euphrates is dried up. They die because they kill each other. So is it that God burns them? Well, how can He burn them if they killed each other with, with weapons? You see, it's a metaphor, brethren. When the Bible uses these terms, these metaphors, they mean that it's the glory of God was revealed to them to such a degree that they ended up killing each other. And the Bible says that the blood rose to the horse's bridle. And we're going to see what that means next week. God willing. Again, quoting from Great Controversy 656 and 657, it says, The whole earth appears like a desolate wilderness. The ruins of cities and villages destroyed by the earthquake, uprooted trees, ragged rocks thrown out by the sea or torn out of the earth itself are scattered over its surface, while vast caverns mark the spot where the mountains have been rent from their foundations. You know, just before the coming of Christ, and we're not going to get into that, there's going to be some serious... We're going to get into that probably in the next week or so. But there's going to be some serious things that are going to be happening. But God has promised to be a shield to His people. And they will be alive and protected. And He will translate them from off the earth. The, the 144,000. So, going back now. Talking about the Sixth Angels Movement. This is the harvest of the death gathered of the de of the death gathered by the sixth angel who is pictured having a reaper's sickle in his hand. Not one wicked person who has rejected God's love and mercy will escape that blood the bloody in gathering despite the fact that they come to see and to acknowledge that they have been in the wrong and God has been in the right. Their repentance comes too late, as did that of Balaam and Judas. While their minds recognize that their lips confess God's truth, their hearts remain unchanged. Were they to be given another opportunity, they would simply revert to their rebellious ways once more. So, during the fifth angel's movement, and even in the beginning of the sixth angel's movement, the wicked have a sense of repentance coming from them. Right? They even bow at the feet of the 144,000. 
But in reality, they're not bowing at the feet of the 144,000. They're bowing at the feet of God. Because God is represented through them. God's glory is seen through them. They're acknowledging that God was, His ways were right. But that doesn't mean that their heart has changed. Because they can't change. They've been fixed. They have sealed themselves off from any change. And, and now they, 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 they become unchangeable. TSA 283 says, Incredible destruction during the plagues will account for immense loss of human life. But vast multitudes will remain to be cut down by one another's hands during the time of the sixth angel's movement. Great Controversy, page 654, says that the wicked are filled with regret, not because of their sinful neglect of God and their fellow men, but because God has conquered, they realize that they have lost the battle. And they're on the losing side. They, they thought Satan was going to win. Because Satan had lied to them. Satan had told them he would, he would win the battle. That he was going to be given full authority over the earth. And anybody who would follow him, they would be given good positions. But now they realize that was a lie. They realize... That God has conquered. They lament that the result is what it is. But they do not repent of their wickedness. They would leave no means untried to conquer if they could. You see that is the, 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 the mind of, of the, those that are sealed in darkness. TSA 283 paragraph 2 says the scriptures plainly show that it is the work of the sixth angel under the urging of the seventh. To affect this tremendous slaughter of the wicked. Yeah, that's an interesting point there. Because that's what the scriptures tell us in Revelation, right? The scriptures plainly show us in the book of Revelation chapter 14. That this is the work of the sixth angel. Under the urging of the seventh. That affects this tremendous slaughter of the wicked. But, but how can it be? How is it? Is it really... An act of the sixth angel that slaughters these people? Well, it goes on to say, However, as the quotations presented above plainly show, the righteous members of the sixth movement do nothing more than stand by and watch it all happen. They are not seen to be weapon-wielding ex executioners wiping out their enemies like the shepherd's rod movement teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. But to them at this time will be fulfilled this promise found in Psalm 91 verses 7 and 8. Psalm 91 verses 7 and 8 says this. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. This Bible prophecy, Psalm 91 verse 7 and 8, will actually be fulfilled during the sixth angel's movement. This is a prophecy. Psalm 91, 7 and 8 is a prophecy that will be fulfilled during the, seven, the sixth angel's movement. TSA 283 paragraph 3 says it would be quite impossible. And notice this is a very important point. I want you to really pay attention to this. It would be quite impossible for the righteous at this time to occupy the role of executioner. Why? Why would you say that? Because the, the shepherd rods teach that this, that's the case, that they will be execution, they will be executing the wicked. So why, why is it impossible for the righteous at the time of the six angels movement to occupy the role of an executioner? Why? Because this would be so totally contrary to God's character at the very time when the most perfect possible reflection of that character is essential to their work. In other words, if they were the slayers, they would undo all that had been achieved till that point in time. Because the whole movement of the fourth angel is to, is to unmask 
the true nature of God's character to the world. That is the movement. To show that God is non-violent and does not slay anyone. All He does is save, bless, protect. That is what God, God is in the business of protecting, blessing, and, and, and shielding, and, and healing. He's not in, in, in the business of destroying, making people sick, you know, being an executioner. He doesn't have to do that. And he doesn't do that. It's against his nature of love. The Bible gives us the, 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 the very uh, uh, pronounced principle that whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. God doesn't have to intervene or inter, uh, uh, interpose in that natural consequence of sin. Sin has its own con uh, consequences. It brings forth its own effects. God does not have to proactively bring upon the wicked anything but love. The wicked will bring upon themselves destruction. Because they will be stepping out from the protection and blessings and mercies of God. So then, in what sense then do these believers at this time thrust in their sickle and reap the harvest of the earth? This must be the question in all of our minds at this point. In what sense then do these believers at this time thrust in their sickle and reap the harvest of the earth? How can a work which is described as being very active and direct be fulfilled simply through their standing passively by as observers? Now, he goes on to say in TSA 284, paragraph 2. Help in understanding this can be obtained by studying the role of the second angel who announced the fall of Babylon and called on God's true children to separate from her. This is very key. Very key. The members of the second angel's movement did not produce the spiritual destitution they correctly saw and declared. Think about that for a minute. It was the presentation of the first angel's message which caused the result announced by the second. Had there been no necessity to proclaim these consequences, the members of the second angel's movement would have been mere silent spectators of them. Give me one second. Hey, ladies, you guys got to keep it really quiet. Thank you. I'm going to repeat that again. It was the, had there been no necessity to proclaim these consequences, the members of the second angel's movement would have been mere silent spectators of them. This is the way that it will be in the case of the sixth angel's movement, which is the natural extension of the fifth. They will be silent observers of the results of their work when they were members of the fifth angel's movement. The slaughter is said to be done by them because it is during the period of their term that it takes place and because it is the natural outworking of their witness. This is a very interesting point, brethren. Because... This also unlocks the mystery of how God Himself allows Himself to take the responsibility for the natural outworking or the effect that comes upon the wicked when they reject righteousness. Amazing. You know, Unrighteousness is just simply a perversion of righteousness. In other words, without righteousness, there could be no unrighteousness. Because unrighteousness is a perversion of righteousness. Right? It's when you go away from righteousness that you go into unrighteousness. Because the first thing that existed was righteousness. Unrighteousness never existed prior to righteousness. Same thing when we see power. Power comes from God. Satan uses that power which comes from God to do evil. And so that's perverted power. But that power still comes from God. So you, we can see how God 
people put the blame on God and God can also uh, allow himself to be blamed for things that he didn't do that just were naturally outworkings of people choosing to reject his righteousness and his principles. Why? Because all power comes from him and all creatures, even the wicked, come from him. Because all creatures, everything that exists came from God. Right? So here we see that the slaughter is said to be done by the sixth angel because during that period we see the natural outworking that comes from their witness. So that's why it could be said that it comes from them. Pretty, pretty uh, profound. And there's still another sense in which they can be described as the actual slaughters as well. Slaughterers. And this is found in TSA 284, paragraph 3. It says, Because they will be blessed with the fullness of divine love and compassion, it will be impossible for them to observe the destruction of the wicked without the deepest sadness and the most intense pain. They will feel a tremendous compulsion to rush in between the mad murderers seeking each other's lives in an effort to halt the carnage. But they must understand that all this has to be and they must not interfere. We have to know this today, brethren. See, brethren, God is preparing us for that day today. You might see people who you even love on the other side, ready to kill each other. And God is telling us today that when you see this happen, we cannot interfere with them. We cannot. You might feel that tremendous compulsion to rush in between the bad murderers seeking each other's lives. You might want to halt the carnage. You might want to put an effort to try to prevent them from doing what they're going to do. But what we need to understand today is that at that time there's nothing else that we can do. Everything has been done. We must not interfere at that time. The greater our love for God and His creatures, the more pressing and terrible this drive will be. It will require tremendous willpower to resist it. Just as Jesus steadfastly set His face to go to Jerusalem against the pressures of souls all around Him who were reaching out for His saving ministry, so God's people will steadfastly hold their ground when they are tempted to do otherwise. You know, think about this for a minute. How much God is tempted to step in and prevent the carnage when God's people are already sealed. If you think about how much temptation it would be for us, think about how much of a temptation it is for God. Wow. But God recognizes that He cannot interfere. Why? Because to interfere at that point would be to disrespect and dishonor the free will choice of the unrighteous. It would be to disrespect them. It would be to impose his own authority over them when they were not willing. It would be like raping someone. It's hard to, to imagine it that way, but that's exactly what it would be like. It is well recognized. It is a well recognized principle that if you do not lift a hand to save a person from death, you are judged as killing him. Think about that. Because they will stand by and do nothing to stop the slaughter at that time, it can be said, in one sense, that they do the actual destruction. They don't do it physically, but in a certain context, it, it could be said that. Because they sit back and they, do, they don't interfere. Because they know that they can't. If they interfere at this point, it would be imposing their, their will on the will of the wicked. It would be them violating the uh, fixed choices of the wicked. And that, that would be a full misrepresentation of God's character. And they won't do that. They will not do that at that time because they are sealed with the seal of God. They would have the, received the mind of Christ and they would not step in to violate the free choice of the wicked. 
I close with this final statement found in TSA 284, paragraph 4. Some may question why this should call for another movement, especially when there is little or nothing for its members to accomplish. It is done so as to identify the next phase in the development of events. Under the ministry of the fourth angel's movement, the final warning is taken to every individual on the earth. This is the movement we're in today. We're in the final warning movement of the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 14. Where the warning will be taken to every individual on the earth. As soon as the work is ended, another begins. Namely, the revelation of God's character to the point, to the point, so we know that the revelation of God's character takes place, starts taking place during the fourth angel's movement, but during the fifth, the revelation of God's character goes to a point where the Lord will successfully deliver the wicked from their erroneous concepts in regard to Him. The successful achievements of this work will be attained when the rebels and their ministers confess they are wrong. That happens during the uh, fifth and sixth angels movement. Actually during the fifth and then the sixth we see what happens. Then the way for the next phase is cleared which will be the slaughter of those who have lost all in the great conflict of life. To cover this phase another angel is required even if those symbolized by him do not actually do anything but stand by and watch. Brethren, this is the, 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 the close. I'm going to close here. I, I, I'm hearing some background noise. So if you have your mic, uh, uh, can you please mute it? All right. So this closes our study, brethren, and it's solemn. It is solemn because these are things that are going to happen. We want to, And so if we know that these are going to happen, Right? We're starting off the year with a, some very solemn points. God is showing us, listen, we have a clean slate. Right now, the record of our life in this year has just begun. There's nothing on that page except what happened from yesterday to today. Right? And hopefully we did not dishonor God within the last 24 hours. Right? But we want to move forward in this new clean slate because it is a type of clean slate. And we want to move forward and we want to prepare our hearts and minds. We want to allow God to prepare our hearts and minds to understand what's coming, not to be deceived by all of these uh, false narratives of what people think is coming, all the good stuff that's going to happen we know that good stuff will happen with us in our minds when we allow God to do these good things in our minds, right? But not necessarily all around us. Good things can happen for us personally if we are in Christ because God, all, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights and, and every, everything that happens to God's people are, are good, right? Uh, so we know that good will be for God's people. But we see that there's bad things coming to the earth and to those who are in the world. And our prayer should be at this time, Lord, take me as your own. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, use me. Because people are headed for destruction. Are we sighing and crying? If we're not, we need to be praying for that. Lord, help me to, to really feel what you feel for these people. To love them like you love them. Help me to have your love in my heart so that I can warn the world, so that I can be a, a vessel for, for you, Lord, to, to warn the world, to be part of the fourth angel's movement that's taking place right now. And even to, 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 to warn the world so that less people could be on the side of, 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 of Satan during the fifth and sixth angel's movements. May the Lord have mercy on us. and May, may we really dedicate our lives to God in this new year that we're, we're in today let us reconsecrate our lives to God today and ask him to use us in this work to be these angels of Revelation chapter 14 and verse and chapter 18 let us pray dear Heavenly Father I want to thank you so much for your word we thank you for showing us 
what's, hap what's going to happen behind the scenes and even what's happening now. Help us not to be deceived by the things that are going on in this world. Satan is seeking to deceive the world. That's why the world will wander after the beast. Lord, please be with us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, dear God. And help us to cooperate with you. To keep the slate clean for this year. That we may not live the same way we lived last year. But that we will really determine in our hearts that we will allow you to sanctify us by your truth and that we will put forth every effort to cooperate with you and to finish this work. Lord, we pray that you hold back the winds until every person is ready and that every person has done and finished the work that you have called them to do. For Lord, this is a new year. We, don't, we know that even though we don't know what details are going to come in this year, we know that things are not going to really get better. So Lord, help us to be ready and faithful to you, trusting in you, allowing you to be our guide, our provider, and our uh, strength. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Be with us as we continue in today's Sabbath. We pray for more blessings to come upon us. And we pray that you bind our hearts together to Christ and to one another. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.